The top three stories of the week. Welcome back to All That Jam, where music has new limits. I'm Kevin, joined by Amanda, and we are here with the top three stories of the week. How are you doing this week, Amanda? Kevin, I am so pumped up for next week. I feel like I'm a kid. The excitement level is just like so good. Do, do you want to? Do we want to start off the top with uh, <clears throat> any insider info we have on maybe people running into us? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, I know that there really hasn't been any official word out, and that's just you know kind of across the board for the festival. But yeah, thanks to um, Groove Safe and Free between one and three o'clock on Thursday and Saturday, location to be announced. Um, we're going to get to do some game show kind of fun and and just have a really good time. So I am really happy about that. I've got some prizes lined up and um, yeah, hopefully a lot of people who maybe hear what's going on will be able to walk over and, um, you know, have some good times with us. No, no, do we know anything about the the venue itself? What is, is it an indoor thing? Is it an outdoor thing? Do we know anything like that? Nope, nope, nope. But um, I guess we'll all find out together. <laughs> yeah, no, I really don't know. Um, I think that this one part of the planning, you know, there's a lot of people who have been putting in a bunch of time to figure out what's going to happen at these cabins, but. Um, I mean, hopefully in the next, well, it's got to happen when, soon, right? <laughs> uh, when you say cabin, I have a vision in my head of a huge indoor yeah. space, but I saw pictures of something that were areas at Firefly and the cabin looked like a guard shack. And then it was That's just picnic what I'm thinking. around it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's a pretty small, um, type of building, but a place that's, you know, a good meeting kind of meeting right. center. Yeah. Instead of everybody meeting at the Ferris wheel. Right. Which I've seen pictures of that from um, prior Firefly weekends. And gosh, it looks super cool. I'm excited mm -hmm. to see that. Yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. So Fish is warming up. Um, they're playing Bethel as we're recording this tonight. Um, apparently a flood of epic proportions is going to be going on. But mm -hmm. they just got out of Grand Rapids, which were indoor shows. Always nice. You don't have to deal with the elements. And a guy named Billy Strings came out both nights, and it kind of has polarized the whole fish community. <laughs> yes, and I shouldn't be surprised at that, Kevin. I mean, I know better. This is this is not. Maybe it's my first Billy Strings sit in, like for all of us. But you know, it really shouldn't shock me anymore. Just the the immediate reaction that people have, because I think there's a lot of visceral emotion that happens that maybe people would feel differently about. A little while after the fact, maybe. Um, Fish Twitter, as always, never leaves us wanting for drama and opinions. <laughs> if I could say that. It's so fantastic. Um, I, I, I love I, it. <laughs> I was fine with it. I love seeing that guy plug in his guitar. I thought mm -hmm. he added some uh, really tasteful stuff to some of the songs. Evolve, he was doing these little fills. It was really beautiful. Um, yeah. two nights, I could see some people being like, all right, one night, you know, I paid to see fish, but something historic. The last time they had a guitarist play two nights in a row, sit in with them was Warren Haynes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, we'll it's, just, up there. <laughs> it's not something that happens a lot. And I think it's a reminder, if anything, that these guys, they're all friends. They all know each other. They all love what what each other does, whether it's the same, different, doesn't matter. There's a lot of respect and admiration across the board. And you could see that. Um, of course, I have to say, I was also um, not disappointed to see some of the torch memes back out again. Thank you to those of no. you making them because I really miss them from the, the goose tray sit in at Radio City a couple summers right. ago. It's kind of the height of, of the torch passing conversation. But to me, I don't know. I never really, number one, would mind that. I like anything that feels a little bit different or, you know, apart from a typical show. Why not? So mm -hmm. good for them. And he, they were all clearly having such a good time. 
They were. They were. And I posed this question to you earlier. Um, Derek Truck sat in last year, and there was not this consternation over it. It was like, oh, cool, Derek Truck sat in. That was really good. Nice. I don't get why there's – why it seems to me almost like Goose was dragged into it because Billy was sitting in. And there's mm-hmm. some – they came up at the same time, whereas Derek Trucks, when he was 19, was out there melting faces. And that was in the early, ni- late 90s, you know, early 2000s. That is true. And and there is a, um, I think there's a slightly different uh, label or view of somebody like Derek Trucks that he's not infringing on the jam band space proper. Possibly. He's there, obviously so talented and so many people love to go, you know, see what he does. But I don't think that he's he equates in a lot of people's mind with the scene the same way that people look at Billy or and I still to this day wonder, is it a jealousy thing? Is it a what what exactly is it that is so polarizing? That's a great word. I think exactly like what you said. And not I'm really not sure. And my, my thing with Derek is he's a soloist. <clears throat> you give him the song, he plays mm-hmm. his part. And, you know, and when you go see his band with his wife, you you go to see them. They aren't a jam band. You aren't hopping on to Desi Chuck's tour or something like that. You know, you go see them one night. It's an evening. I could even see putting on a button up shirt to go see them because that's the way they present it. Whereas Billy's a jammer. You let him plug in, you stick him on the stage with anybody, I think he'd have a good time. I think so, too. And, you know, having seen Billy sit in with other bands that are more in that bluegrass, jamgrass space, of course, that feels like a very natural thing. But that's not the only kind of music that Billy or anyone else can play. So sorry if that challenges some people's ideas of where they can fit him into a corner of of the music community, but that's not necessarily all the things that that person would want to do anyway. And um, actually, Kevin, that that is one of our stories for the week was um, great segue. Yeah, was Billy's um, kind of after the fact. Um, Billy wrote this note, we'll call it, about his experience with Fish um, last Tuesday and Wednesday in Grand Rapids. And, you know, we've we've actually, I think, at least once brought up some of the authentic communications, the really heartfelt way that Billy Strings seems to communicate online. He does seem to have a really good presence um, of mind when he shares. It feels very authentic and very humble and just real. He doesn't seem afraid either to state certain things. And and what I like about it is it's not always when there's just something bad or when a show has to be canceled. You know, he gets mm-hmm. heartfelt, I think, at other moments. So yeah, so if if you haven't seen it out there, um, look for the note. I know Jambase has an article on this, so you can just, you know, search up Billy Strings. But let me just read some of this. Um, he said, sitting in with fish for the last two nights was nothing short of a surreal experience, like something out of one of my wildest dreams. Um, And then, you know, what happened was, I guess, um, Billy got in touch with Trey for tickets and said, let's let's do this thing. (laughs) As he says, I just about shit my pants. I mean, what a reaction. Right. And you can picture it because how would we feel if anything like that ever happened? We would have the same exact uh, reaction. And so he said, I was just trying to come and see the show. I really didn't know I'd be in it. Um, And then, you know, he goes on and he basically says it was magic as a fan to be on that stage and feel it so close to me to interact was just sacred. And, you know, that's amazing. I don't know, honestly, how anyone could look at something like that, whether you're a fan of Billy Strings or Bluegrass or not, and have have an issue with it. Um, Good for them. I I love that. Exactly. I mean, so... So heartfelt, so compassionate, so so um, reverent of the band. Yeah. He called it a sacred space, and he mentioned a pulsating orgasm of music, and he used <laughs> all this great language. and And the fact that he called up was like, "Dude, I want to come see you." And Trey's like, "Oh man, you got to come play with us. Here's a right? bunch of songs to learn." 
And you know, just, I don't want to get in the way too much, which I have seen with other Billy Siddons. He really, I think, does a incredible job of being very conscious of his presence on the stage, what energy he's bringing, the dynamic. I mean, that's a very thoughtful approach. And I, I know other people would do that too, but you can really see that. And he says, you know, I was feeling like I shouldn't be up there messing up their show. I mean, could you imagine this guy's a master of what he does? Well, ho I mean, hopefully, you know? hopefully he didn't go on fish Twitter afterwards. <laughs> I wonder, you know, you, you gotta wonder what, if, if people see that stuff and if they do, I mean, it's just brutal sometimes really. Mm -hmm. And I'll say as a as a woman who has waded into fish Twitter, you know, a number of times, you kind of know you have to be ready for anything, literally anything. We remember mm -hmm. Fish Survivor that lasted all of one hour. Um, right. It's probably the hardest hour of my life online. <laughs> but but that's the nature of of the beast for whatever reason. So good stuff. It makes me smile. It makes me like him even more just as a human. And also, Kevin, let's remember he is only thirty one years old. Mm -hmm. the maturity maybe it's life experiences getting to where he is in his life now but whatever it is this is someone who really seems to just be able to look past himself in right. these situations yeah, he's he's already been through his tray period and done the drugs and been through the recovery so he's got years of clean sailing ahead of him that's right that's right and you know i wonder that might be a trend for for musicians who are that age range or even younger, maybe the whole party thing that we remember Played to out. that extreme. Yeah. I mean, cause we've just seen, it doesn't do the thing for you that long-term that you think it's going to do, you know, and people yeah. talk about that more anyway, these days too. So. exactly. Um, and I yeah. guess we'd be remiss just throw out speaking of drugs and its effect on bands. Jerry did die today. It, I guess is what the, 29th anniversary it'll be 30 years next year next year right yes yeah that's right 90 yep it will um live for live music i think it was put out a really beautiful playlist this morning uh in honor of that and it's all ballads and it's beautiful and i would say um you know maybe that's something we'll share i listened to a little bit of it this morning some of my favorite stuff um but i thought that that's a nice tribute is to get back to the love and, and just keep it there. Yeah. 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 Right. What we got next? All right. Lollapalooza. Remember that? <laughs> um, so this article, I saw it last week and I wasn't sure if I wanted to talk about it, but I, I do think when festivals especially are trying to do things a little bit differently in terms of operations, um, I find that fascinating. We have talked a lot about the the general kind of economy of festivals and what that means for the scene. Um, one thing I thought uh, was pretty cool, and I don't know if it's happening elsewhere, is that um, in Digital Music News last week, there was a pretty thorough article on how Lollapalooza's main stage is entirely battery powered. Audio, lighting, stage production, all the video, um, and powered solely on this hybrid battery system. Uh, and it's supposed to sustain everything for the duration of the show. And this is part of a sustainability initiative um, that a, a couple of different big corporations have worked together with to um, basically make Lollapalooza the first you know, big festival in the US to do something like this. So I thought that was interesting, um, you know, trying to power the <clears throat> the batteries are charged by electricity though are they solar batteries do we know that so it's a hybrid is my understanding okay. yes okay so, so, so they they can plug it in charge it all the way up and then run the solar and mm -hmm. where they could charge it all the way up with solar and then if they need to they could charge it again. yeah yeah so i guess a lot the of batteries have you seen the yes. battery for a car yeah, I know, right? So I guess it's a 1.5 MWH, and, and I've not seen megahertz. So I guess yeah. So there's there's just a lot of power back there, and so I guess you know the goal for sure is to try to minimize um, the runtime of the generators because of all the fuel and emissions. Right, but, but but you you do this right, you figure out how to do it mm -hmm. like completely solar, then you can have a festival anywhere. You could. 
you totally could. So this could open doors for a lot of things. And then, of course, you know, you got to hear from the talking heads at Live Nation. They have a head of global sustainability. You know, we're looking forward to sharing the results and learnings with our network of 200 plus festivals, um, blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, you know, things do need to change at some point. So if we can use some kind of technology to try it, I mean, I'm sure they've done their run throughs. This is not something people are just going to jump into, but um, I'm curious, curious to see how it goes. I, I wish we had sound effects. And anytime you said Live Nation or Ticketmaster, we could have like pitchfork crowd in the back chanting. <laughs> or like a weren't <laughs> weren't. Yeah. Actually, be careful what you wish for, because I would love to have one of those little consoles here. And that's because right. I yeah. listen to radio, especially funny talk radio incessantly growing up. And so I kind of run those in my mind all the time. <laughs> I almost bought little mini air horns for Mondo Green, but then I didn't want to be that person. Um, Either way, I am pro. I am pro the battery thing. I hope it works, even if it is Live Nation doing it. Agree, and I think that's that's a good point, right? If at the end of the day it's something that's helpful, then let's let's see it happen. So, mm -hmm. so good on them and their global sustainability. Um, all right, last story. Um, I saved the most complicated one for last, which is always interesting. You know, I like research. There's some cool stuff going on um, always that is supposed to be helping us understand more about how we as music listeners kind of process um, not only music, but memory. And so um, recently there was um, a study published and the purpose of this was to try to understand more about how people perceive music in a hierarchical sense. That's hard to say. Um, so the findings were published in a, um, a journal called Nature Communications. And basically what it, the study was trying to do was to help understand how our brains compartmentalize, store and retrieve information related to music that we listen to. And I, I looked at this one because um, you know, we've all seen those videos of people who maybe have dementia or something like that and who may not know their family members, but can sing a song. You always hear that music has such staying power within our, you know, our brains. Why is that? And so I always thought that was pretty interesting. And so the story, um, it's, it's kind of connected to that. Um, and we'll definitely, you know, share the links um, for this. But there's not a lot known about how auditory perception and our processes kind of integrates with more complex functions like recognizing or predicting sequences. So, mm -hmm. you know, Kevin, if you've ever heard a song, we all do this. And because of how that song is structured, it might get to a place where we kind of anticipate, here's what's going to happen next. Um, even if it's something we haven't necessarily heard a lot, there's just, um, you know, this formulaic thing that our brains do, and that's a complex function. So understanding like, that a little bit better is pretty sweet. Like dancing to a jam, and you know when it's going to hit the end, and you just, you hit your big move right when the end hits, and it goes back into the song, because in your head, you're playing along with them where it's going, I think, on some level. That's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a, music is such a powerful tool uh, for so many things, but also to help explore, I think, features of the brain that are challenging to understand otherwise, because music just has the series of sounds arranged over time. So it actually is a really great way to investigate how our brains process uh, different kinds of information consciously, not just in the moment, but over these different like time periods. So it was a pretty right. small sample size. There were less than 100 participants, um, but they all, you know, were... Um, kind of involved in inter being introduced to a short musical piece, just very brief, listening to it twice, they had to memorize it. Um, and then they had to go through these auditory recognition tasks while their brain activity was recorded. Um, so I just, I think this stuff is super cool. Um, and it got right. more and more complex as, right. as the kind of participation part went on with variations and, the brain was able for a lot of these people to generate prediction errors. So basically like, wait, I thought this was gonna happen. They can see this with this um, technology, you know, the brain kind of rerouting 
it's thinking super cool. So yeah, thought that'd be fun to share. Um, I've always had a thought theory that the music you listen to in high school is really the only music you like that you can find other things through your life, but you always go back to the music you listen to in high school. Mm-hmm. And you had you had mentioned in the beginning dementia patients and things and mm-hmm. singing melodies. Maybe there's some truth to that because I mean, I love the cure. Yeah, and if a band came out that was as good as the cure today, and we're going to have a body of work like that, I would probably miss it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I think there's some truth to that. If and if also it's connecting to other memories, mm-hmm. um, then that might that might then help like like velcro it <laughs> or anchor it. Right? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. To you too. It's it's super amazing. We all know. Um, and actually, yesterday's chat with Steve Kelly, we got into this a little bit. Just how you know we all know this. How music connects us without words necessarily. And, and it's something that can be hard to describe, but we all know what that is. Um, and so studies like this are fun because they start to put some science behind what we all experience in one way or another. I'm going to try to explain it a little bit. A little bit. There we go. All right. So if you, great. Um, if our listeners remember, my brain farted there for a minute. Uh, we're not going to be around next week because we're going to be in Delaware at Mondegreen. Um, make sure that you follow our socials and everything. Uh, so we'll have the exact location of what it is. Hopefully we can like cut it out of the map. Maybe we'll take a picture of the map or something, get a marker. We can draw some arrows on it. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. Soon as I, you know, we get that go ahead. I know a lot of people are waiting for that. Um, yeah. So, you know, we'll, uh, We'll share, but um, for everybody that's going, be safe, have some fun, and hopefully we'll run into a bunch of people, um, and then we'll have lots to talk about when we get back. You know, and if you're watching this later, make sure you leave a comment. If you're listening to this as the podcast, uh, like, subscribe on YouTube, like, subscribe too, and remember, stay beautiful, but don't stay underground too long. I'll see you in Delaware, Amanda. All right, Kevin. See you